Hello, Smackheads. I'm Ben Gilman, and welcome back to Smack Podcast, where we discuss episode by episode the cult sci fi comedy classic Red Dwarf. I am very, very peppy today because it's my favorite episode so far of the whole show. Um, today, I'm joined by Tom Hill. Hey. Troy Salmon. Yeah. And Dan Rudge. Hi, yeah. I nearly let that, I nearly fucked that up. So I'm quite happy I managed to keep that on pace. Close, 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 close. <laughs> nearly, nearly, nearly. But we got that. So, season two, episode six, Parallel Universe, Smug Mode Engage Smegheads. So, this one, um, it basically, Holly creates um, a new star drive called Holly Hot Drive that walks Red Dwarf from one part of space to another within a matter of seconds. In a parallel universe, basically. It all goes wrong when Red Dwarf encounters an alternative dimension. The crew encounter female versions of themselves and Cat encounters another version of himself. A dog. Um, and he gets pregnant. And it, we cut to the credits, basically. Um, that is a very short summing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I try to keep these really short because we tend to try and drag 20 minutes of talking about the episode out. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more, but we can get into it. But um, first of all, this is the episode. that You know how back on the Syndrome episode ages ago, Tom, you were saying, isn't it nice that they've gone back to the cat people and yeah, yeah. brought it back? This is the episode that I would love them to see come back in season 14 when it comes back. Dave has announced it's a 14th season. I yeah, we know. Um, uh, yeah. They've announced that they're bringing it back for another six episodes. I would love Parallel Universe to revisit girls again. I want to see. <laughs> please yeah. give me. What do you guys think? Um, it would be an interesting one. I think you'd be more likely to see that being done as a special rather than as an episode. Mm. You know, like they recently did um, the one for the cat people. So I think I think if they were going to do that, they would probably do a longer one for power, for a Return to the Parallel Universe one. I thought. Yeah. Mm. How about you, Dan? I actually think. Roughly the same as Tom on that one. Mm. To be honest. <laughs> We're looking at things change a lot from this point onwards. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. next year it's more Starbug. They start doing more Starbug. Um, there's a lot more theme tune changes, as we said last week. Yeah, um, there's a there's a lot of stuff to discuss about the entire outlook of Red Dwarf with season three, but I we'll think we should that. leave that till we actually get to season three. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> to get them jumping the gun on it. So we're just going to talk about Tanta because this is the best thing. Ah, oh, such a good start. Oh my gosh, Tom is happy. <laughs> I love I love it. Tanta is one of my favourite things. It's one of my early Red Dwarf memories. It's yeah. Fun. I was a kid. I just found it funny. Now, I've just found this out. I've done some research. I, from their expressions, it's a bang of a tune, first of all. You know it was released as a single, right? Yeah, 1993, and it got to number 17. Yep. Don't know why it took so long, but there we go. But Danny John Jules is having the time of his fucking life. Yeah, this is his thing. Brian, this is what he does for a living. <laughs> Brian Charles and Chris Barry, on the other hand, look like they do not want to be that. They look like me at a fucking wedding when it's time to dance. I do not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> they are in character, though. Yeah, they, well, are, they actually <laughs> did have fun doing it, I think. <laughs> Chris Barry uh, just found out in an interview last year said that it was his least favourite episode. Oh, really? <laughs> To tongue tied, and he said Craig Charles also hated it as well. What the song or the whole episode? The, the dance, the dancing bit. They they did it because Danny wanted it, and they were good mates of Danny. So no offense, they did it just to make him happy because he didn't get a lot in the first two seasons. 
So they decided, let's give Danny a dance number. Um, so they decided to be teammates. Fair and enough. Just take it to the chin for a whole day of dancing. Um, Team players. Kudos <laughs> to them then. Lovely pink salmon suits. Um, yep. <laughs> do you know, it's a bit like the British Empire with the suit on, like a glittery, jazzy version of the British Empire, British Empire, which is when he turned into that leisure manager. Yes. Uh, trust me. Mm-hmm. No, I, no, I remember it. It's, no, I remember the British Empire. Yeah, it's no, him just, being really good. Yeah, it, I it's, it's an underrated show, actually. The British Empire. It's got Chris Barry in it. It can't be that bad. No, but it's quite under. It's quite underrated. Yeah, it's it's a lot funnier than people give it credit for. It's got to be better than Gimme, Gimme, Gimme from that era. Oh, yeah, but no, it was before Gimme Gimme. Definitely give me. better than that. Oh, because Gimme 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 is the most overrated. <laughs> Again, I would watch it over Mr. Brown's Boys. So there's that, I suppose. Maybe Gimme Gimme is not so bad after all. Gimme over what? Um, Mrs. Brown's Boys. Well, yeah. That, mm. Don't. Yes. Copy <laughs> <this>. <laughs> But we'll do that in a special one day. If we, if we talk of... about 90s sitcoms, my favourite was probably Game On, other than Coupling. Oh, underrated. Oh. Can't anyway, no let's get back to it. Anyway, yeah, let's, let's <laughs> stick to what we're doing. Oh, well okay. Right, so, um, the dream recorder, as we come back in, we find out that it's uh, a dream. The dream recorder is shaking like a 1980s Doctor Who set. It is legit. <laughs> there, there we go. There we are. Shut your face, it's been a long time since I've <laughs> But it's really shaky. It's quite funny how it almost looks like it's going to fall over. And Rimmer thinks sex in dreams is weird. I thought he thought Kat's attitude to sex was weird, not sex in dreams. <laughs> it's awful. I've written yeah. here, worst <laughs> shut up line ever. Oh, is that the, um, the worm do? Oh, it's it's torturous. It's brilliant. Would you like a worm do? No. And Lister, <laughs> Mr. Wong, <laughs> uh, <sighs> the mesmer <laughs> stare. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! I just like the bit with the cat. Which bit? Seven or eight women that are right for me. <laughs> hey, I want it. Yeah, I want to Yeah, little <laughs> oh, women. Small group. Small group is seven and eight women. That's quite funny. My wondering days are Uber, buddy. Yeah, that's a bigger mist, kids. That's what we call <laughs> bigger mist. Come on. I think my favourite one is What Are You, a Man or a Munchkin? And Rim responds with I'm off to see the wizard. <laughs> 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 they just wanted us quick. I love the response. Uh, for Holly, because he's he's explaining the Holly Hop drive. It's like two bodies who share the same space but are unaware of each other's existence. River just hits one of the best lines so far on Red Dwarf. Sounds like my parents in bed. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, it's a good line. Oh my gosh. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I know we're I know we're getting towards the end of the episode, but the, the the one that just jumped back into my head was you know when they're doing the pregnancy test for Rim, for Lister at the end, yeah. and they talk about it and they say it's blue for not pregnant, right? It's red for pregnant, yeah. And Rimmer starts going, "Come on, you reds!" Yeah. <laughs> As a football fan, that just made me laugh. It does make me smile. <laughs> oh dear. <sighs> does make me laugh here because um, they're talking about pregnancy and the cats just makes me laugh like um, the, the wonderful possibilities of having children this is like what and like when they grow up and leave home <laughs> before the preg- just before you did the come on you reds um, yeah. <laughs> cat just gets the best lines again man it's just, it does solve the problem of the kids as well um, from uh, blah 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 blah. Flash forward from um, uh, um blah, 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 blah. future oh, echoes. The one that solves the problem of how you get the kids on board. And then, like last week, they actually 
have put a nice little bow on that. Yeah. Quite nice. Um, so about I actually do go back and tie these things off. Yeah. I did have a laugh at... Um, let's talk about the females, because... <laughs> do it. Where do we start with them? Um, Arlene Rimmer. Arlene Rimmer. Um, or through on her bunk, it all says, come on, Arnold, they forgot to fucking change some of the set dressing. Oh, really? But, uh, yes. On the calendar and on, come on, Arnie. Oh, no, that, on... That, that might be a reference to come on, Eileen, and they've changed it to come on, Arnold, because it's a... Oh, yeah, because they, yeah, okay. they reverse everything. Okay. Possibly, I don't know. Okay. So, my, I did laugh, though. Um, she makes a penis joke. Because Rimmer says, you're disgusting. You're only after me for one thing. She goes, why? How many have you got? (laughs) It is quite funny. Um, So Rimmer wants to fuck Rimmer and Lister wants to... Well, they fuck. Um, um, Obviously, the the dog is very... He's very sparringly, but he's Mm -hmm. funny. Cat's reaction to the dog is brilliant. Um, What do you guys think of the dog? And the female cast, um, Hilly, best shine of Hilly. Hilly, sure. Hilly, I like, but then again, Hattie Hayridge is fantastic as she then went and proved in the next three seasons of Red Dwarf. Um, yeah. The so dog, she... I don't know. I never really, I was I never that bothered by the dog. Yeah, it was, it was just I'm a sniff, you a it was Cat's reactions to the dog were funnier than the dog, in my in my opinion. But and the cat breaks the fourth wall. He keeps looking at the audience to say lines, which I found quite funny as well. Does he? Yeah, he refers to the audience a couple of times. Mm, fair enough. Really and subtly, the cat's he, doesn't really turn, noticed it. he doesn't turn to the audience. He just kind of just mouths. Just kind of says it to the audience. Like them, actually acknowledging them. Yeah, like dead Deadpool, yeah. but without the actual. Really clever, without yeah. taking you too much out of it. Yeah. Quite funny. Fair enough. Don't cut. Go, do we yeah, not? Um, sorry, yeah. go on. No, go for it. No, the, um, I think the, the woman who plays Arlene Rimmer is very good. And the woman who plays Deb Lister is brilliant. They've got the kind of mimic mimicry without being e- exactly copies of the two male versions. They do yeah. a very good job of of doing enough mimicry that you recognise the characters again, and so you kind of all re- you automatically know their backstories oh, yeah, because it's yeah. identical to the ones that have happened that we've been watching for two seasons. I think about Angela Bruce. She's the one who played um. Which <laughs> quite a list, wasn't it? There's this that, yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah, and yeah. She, she's watching yeah. about all the and horses. I always remember the episode of her when, um, you know, when they were Batman and Robin, yeah, yes, that's what they are. I always remember her from because of that. <laughs> I was like, oh my days, you saved her from getting, was it, getting mugged. <laughs> the episode was amazing, yeah. So, mm-hmm. I always remember Angela Bruce, I always remember her because of that. She's so much, she's a, she's a cop actor, though, she's in lots of stuff. Well, wow. and the uh, the women are like thirteen years older than both Charles and Chris Barry. Oh damn! Are which they? Is are yeah, they? yeah, yeah, yeah! Jesus Christ! I mean, what Barry and Lister? Well, Chris Barry and Craig Charles were twenty something at this point, so they were like thirty eight. Thirty eight. Well, they were, yeah, they were kind of up there. I forgot about it. Yeah. Jesus, you don't you don't realize that? That's kind of interesting. They look young. Does anybody know why cats um, on the disco bar was sped up? I can never find anything on this because there's a weird bit where cat jumps on the disco ball and it gets sped up and it's never, I've never been able to find anything about why that happened. Oh, no. Um... no I just always assumed it was on purpose. I've yeah. never really thought any more about it. I saw it and that was it. <laughs> Did you find no something else that, that I missed? Absolutely no idea. I just always assumed that it was because that whatever they were doing on it couldn't be done at normal speed and still remain in time. Mm. Or maybe just didn't look as good. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, this is the first episode where Cat refers to him as Goalpost Head. <laughs> or Goalpost Head, he, he goes between the two. And no, they both work. Goalpost Head. <laughs> also, have you noticed something? Cat uh, says Lister. Um, <clears throat> Cat never calls him Lister normally. He calls him Buddy or yeah. just Hey You. Um, the only other times is in season five, the Inquisitor. And Red Dwarf 10, the beginning. That's the only time he ever calls him Lister. He otherwise he just says, hey. Well, that was also a bit weird. Can I uh, just bring up something that I really liked? Sure. The bit where you actually find out about like their um like their universe and how it mirrors things most often. Yeah. Like, the entirety of the gender roles are, it's the same person, but they are completely realigned. Yeah. And so you, like, hear things about, like, Nellie Armstrong, first human to land on the moon, and Wilma Shakespeare, yeah. Wilma Shakespeare yeah. such as Rachel <laughs> the Third. Mm. It just makes me think I wouldn't want to have bumped into Henrietta the Eighth. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Is the- did they also talk about burning the underpants or something rather than burning the bras? Yes. Yeah. Or Amy Hitler or something like that. I don't. Did they reference Hitler? I don't think so. No, no I'm saying like girls with names. I think she's <laughs> yes. fan, fan fiction writing over there in the corner. Like fan fiction, fan fiction. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, yeah, that's a good point that Dan's made. I love that bit. That yeah. is just a little bit off. Well, that's that's the thing I like because Lister who doesn't think of himself as being unattractive, finds what Deb does unattractive. But it's the like same she, thing that he does. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's my point. And <laughs> yeah. Rimmer, Arlene tries to do the mesmer and the worm do and all that, and he's like, repulsed that she would try these things. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> well, you can admit I, I, I actually thought, in a, in a show that is, for the most part, all about having fun. I thought it was actually quite a nice like comment on those on the gen on that kind of thing. It actually made quite an interesting point about how men see these things as being perfectly normal until someone does it to them. Yeah, does it to them? Yeah, exactly. It's like, I mean, um, we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks with Men Behaving Badly. I was recently watching the episode where um, Caroline Quentin starts acting like Gary in the pub. <laughs> and, I was thinking, and it made me think of this. She sits with her legs open and burns. Yeah. yeah. But starts, oh, um, line them up. He, he, a little logger for a little man. He won't be ready for half an hour, but that's enough of our sex life. And just <laughs> all that stuff. Oh, and it's genuinely uncomfortable. But he does it all the time. And it's like, that makes me feel uncomfortable when it's reversed. And it's the same with this. I just, yeah, I like it. It's clever. And it's true, you do kind of get used to certain gender stor- norms and the way that people behave. And when those roles are reversed, you do feel uncomfortable. Weird. Yeah, it's true. Is female oh. women worse than male women, then? No, they're identical. They're the same. same. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a gender. All right, all right. Do you think that they would be exactly the same as our male guys if we had a spin-off? It would exactly be the yeah, same. I think they'd be so, identical, yeah. Yeah. So they most probably had two female listers, two female rimmers. There's a male, there's a male Kachansky somewhere, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, there will be. Christine Kachansky will become Christopher oh, wait, wait, Kachansky. Wait, wait, wait. wait, there's a female ace. <laughs> ha. Oh. A female oh. ace rimmer, yeah. What a girl. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, brilliant! But yeah, um... I want to see that spin-off now. <laughs> I don't care if that, that. I want to see a mini series with that Ace Rimmer female version. Please give that to me. I have the to un- see that in my life. The un- the only thing with this episode, I sit and I wonder. And maybe I'm reading too much into it. Whether they knew that Norman Lovett was going to leave at this point, which is why they did an episode where they could introduce a different Holly. 
Well, he's a he's a grumpy fuck apparently, and they were trying to get rid of him anyway. Well, no, the re- the reason that it happened is because it, uh, seasons one and two were filmed in Manchester. Yeah. Season three was filmed in London, and Norman Lovett had just moved to Edinburgh, mm. so it was a, he didn't want to make that journey. Yeah, okay. so if you listen to the backstage interviews, he was a grumpy little gnome. Yeah, I know. Because I've seen I've seen videos yeah. with him being interviewed. He is bitch and moan until they gave him his ball back like a little child. No, anyway, don't, don't, I prefer don't him much bash Norman. What? Don't bash Norman. I'm not bashing I'm not Norman. Norman. I'm just saying he's a bit of a diva. That's it. I love Norman Lovett. But... I love the character, but I just no, I don't know whether they decided that he was whether he decided he was leaving by this point, or whether it's just pure chance that after he then he then announced he was leaving afterwards, and they went, well, we've got a perfect replacement. Mm. I just wonder whether the what the situation was there, but yeah, it's it's nothing major. It's just a personal thing. I mean, I I didn't come to actually start watching Red Dwarf until season three originally, so I was the eight, season three was the first series that I watched when it came out. So for me, Holly was female until I went back and watched season one and two like a couple of years later, and it was weird to me to see a male version of Holly. Yeah, I'll watch it later as well, too, but I'm going to do it later. I, I, I have a question. Go on. How do computers fuck? Well, I want to know... They interface. It goes download, upload, download, upload, download, upload. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> I've got some difficult questions here about pregnancy and babies, because... Uh, God, this episode's loaded with some questions. I do, <laughs> before we get serious with the sexual shit, um, we see the blue midget again. I do love a bit of totty from female Rimmer. Always find that funny. Totty, um, totty, totty. Um, so, how did she get him pregnant? Well, uh, they never explain that, do they? <laughs> yeah, but I feel like, how would you think? Because it is funny. It's brilliant. Well, I would assume that rather than him ejaculating into her, the egg goes the opposite way and up him. <laughs> That'd be my guess. Yeah, okay. so, I've, actually, I've actually got an idea for this. Okay. Go on. Right. So this idea comes from somewhere, so I'm going to have to describe it briefly. There's right. an author called Ian Banks. Right. And yes. He and he writes some books under the name name Ian M. Banks, and those books are science fiction books. It's brilliant. In one of those books, it's called The Player of Games. A guy goes to a completely alien civilization that's well away from the main, totally evolved beyond the need for jobs or anything luxury sort of civilization spanning loads of artificial intelligence is way, way beyond what a human could be able to process and unimaginable wealth and power. Right. He's sent away off from this, off to this far-flung place, which is ruled by one species in particular. And that one species has three distinct genders. And I think that basically what happens in Red Dwarf is they change Lister briefly from being the male gender that has the seed to the intermediate gender, which is the housing for the seed and the egg. Okay. So overly technical and mm-hmm. like all of that, but you've got to have some way that that actually works. And being as as we are biologically, we would have no place to store that embryo at all. Mm-hmm. I think they kind of have to do that. I mean, I was thinking that maybe... She, the seed goes from her to him, just up through his junk. Yeah, and that's how it happens. But how he gives birth to babies when he's got a penis, I don't know. They cut open and eats they... a cesarean. Ah, not out through his arsehole, then that's good. No, no, it's done by cesarean. Okay, they, exp- they explain, they explain that, um, he says, How can I be pregnant? and they say, Well, they've had, they've had male monkeys done by c section. Rimmer explains that. Yeah. Towards the end of the episode, so I, th- although they don't state it explicitly, I think they basically tell you that it's a C-section. Yeah, fair play. They covered themselves. Yeah. So can you then tell me how machines have babies? 
How does a baby scutter get made? A mummy, a mummy scutter and a daddy scutter who love each other very much. That's not my question. <laughs> do, do do they get constructed inside of her inside her womb, and they just pop out? In honesty, I, I think it's a throwaway joke. I know. <laughs> I would no, drag it out you, for convenience. Whenever, whenever you ask that question, I don't know why, but I do get the Pixar logo. <laughs> yeah, when you <laughs> it goes, up the light. <laughs> it goes yes. a little bit like that. <laughs> I think maybe they just go right. So you want to have kids? Okay, press a button. Can we have two kids, please? Okay, thank you. And they just go off. That's the more innocent one. But then I had this weird dream where you know you're thinking female scutter, maybe just inside of her, it just constructs a baby. They pop out. I don't That's know. Funny. It's not dirty. It's just they're robots. So maybe. Yeah. Like I say, it's a throwaway joke. <laughs> it does make you want to think, and that's clever about this episode. Um, but like I said, um, to wrap it up, um, could I say I one would or two love... things first, though? Huh? Could I say one or two things first? Go, on. go, go for it. Man. Take it. Well, one thing was we were talking about like our favorite episode from this series. Yeah. The most readers polls. For Red Dwarf, including the one for Red Dwarf magazine, do have this episode as people's favourite. Understand? It's always this or Quig, I find. And some very scary people put status leak at number one, but we won't talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> if you are, this is the bit where you turn off the podcast and you find out that we don't fucking want you following us from here on out, okay? Um, yeah, but Dan is right. Um, it's personally, I can definitely love Quig as well, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't rubbish you on Quig, Quig is fantastic as well but for me, it's just the concept of complete Ozabit female crew and it's just done really cleverly there isn't, like, if it wasn't for Quig, this would be the best episode of the, the season, for me yeah yeah, I agree with that, just, yeah. I mean, I love better than life just because I do but there's another contender. You got three contenders this season for best episode. You know. I mean, I'm uh, intrigued to know what people. If you were to take series one and series two, and actually list them from favorite from worst to favorite, what people would. Maybe have. we should do that. Maybe we should do that between seasons and just rank them. But it will get really boring by the tenth season, where we have to re-rank everything again. Maybe one day we do a voting system and then we just rank them based on points. But I know that I disagree with you guys on what my favourite episode of the first two seasons is. But uh, that, That's the beauty of this show. There's so many strong episodes. Queek is my second favourite episode of the first two seasons. My favourite is actually from series one. Yeah. I've had an just... idea. Go on. Okay, this is going to take a while. But... <laughs> what about if we go season by season and we literally randomly out of a hat have the episodes just in terms of which one we would vote for as being better or worse face off against each other for our voting. Our oh, tournament. <laughs> and then have the winners face off against each other for the best episode of the entirety of Red Dwarf. It's like a knockout, but it's much better than spending five hours boring the tits of everyone while we <laughs> Just every drunker with beer, arguing in a pub. When by that time we get to it, COVID's most probably gone. Troy will come down. We'll get in a pub, put the phone down, and talk bollocks for five hours about the I have a and podcast. I have a pop a punch up afterwards, and that's the last sound you hear the podcast. I like Dan's idea. Sudden <laughs> death. <laughs> but. I would, I think, I, I would argue that Status Leak is the second worst episode for me out of the first 12, and if that is your second least favourite episode, then that's a pretty strong show. My, my least favourite is Waiting for God, which is the cat one. Yeah, I think everyone would agree. <laughs> it's very hard to, it's very hard to not be worse than that. I don't know, Thanks for the Memory was a fairly, mm, Episode as well, but Stasis Leak is slightly worse. <laughs> okay. 
Anyway, um, let's wrap it up, boys. Let's, let's call it. Can I just you know, one thing I'd forgotten until I actually rewatched it today. I just watched literally the tongue dyed bit yeah. today, just and I'd I must have seen it before, but I hadn't noticed it. You know when they're that bit when uh, Danny Drew goes down to his knees and the two of them are doing the harmony. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't noticed that Craig Giles starts twisting his nuts to get the high notes. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't even see that. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, literally, he does. He reaches and you see him because his eyes cross because he just. I've got set toes. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed the eyes, but I didn't know what he was touching. Yeah, it's because he's grabbing his nuts to make himself go to the high note. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> but I love the little touches like that. And on that bombshell of his <laughs> penis, <laughs> we are going to leave it here. Good episode. Oh, fantastic episode. So we'll be back next week um, for season three. Um, thank you so far for all the support and everything. We've got um, quite a lot of grand support for Smug Mode, which has really been beneficial for us. We really appreciate it. Um, please continue to help support us, spread the podcast where you can, and we'll be back very soon. So it's goodbye from me. Bye from me. Bye from me. And bye from me. Smeg off, you smegheads. <laughs>